The word of God is full of knowledge and wisdom. And we have more knowledge today available to us than at any other time in human history. And they say that the amount of human knowledge and information is doubling every 12 hours. It used to be every few years. But now the amount of human knowledge and information is doubling, doubling every 12 hours. That's astonishing, isn't it? And since the advent of the internet, we have more knowledge at our fingertips today than we can possibly process. I look at my humble collection of books, and I know I need probably about five lifetimes to read all of my books. But uh, think about how many lifetimes would it be to, to just scratch the surface of, of knowledge. And this world, there's so much information, there's so many things, of sources of information and knowledge and education. Yet despite all of this, it doesn't necessarily mean that the world has much wisdom. Wisdom. This is something different. Some of us put it like this. Knowledge is the ability to accumulate facts. You know, you can get your phone out and you get facts on all kinds of things now, can't you? Knowledge, it's abundant. Then there's understanding where you have the ability to apply those facts to a specific situation. Understanding. And then wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to use your knowledge and understanding to pursue a wise course of action. It's one thing to have knowledge and even understanding, but it's another thing to have wisdom. We know that it's really important to be discerning because not all information is true or good. And we can't always trust the so-called fact-checkers. They can be biased in an ungodly way. And the highest and most important thing that we can want and search for is wisdom. This is what really counts. What does the Bible say then about wisdom and knowledge? And how can we have it? The Bible talks a whole lot about wisdom. For example, we can see in the book of James, we're going to go there. Basically, there's two types of wisdom. Two. Two types of wisdom and they're contrasting. There's that which is from above and that which is not from above. The Bible talks about godly wisdom, which is from above. We're going to get to that a bit later. But it also tells us about another kind of so-called wisdom. And this wisdom is called earthly, sensual, and devilish. So there's a wisdom that is from above, which is valid, which we should seek after, but there is wisdom that is not, definitely not from above, which we should steer away from. And we see that in James 3. It talks about wisdom that is not from above. It says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. So since the dawn of time, man has been part of a cosmic conflict between truth and error. And God's word warns us against worldly wisdom. Think of worldly wisdom. It's worldly, it's earthly thinking. It's focused on the senses. It's sensual, it says. Focused on the senses, on what is fleshly. And it's devilish. It comes from the devil. Do we stop and think about what it is that we consume? Is it earthly, sensual, devilish? When I hear those three words there, this wisdom that's not from above is earthly, sensual, devilish, it sounds like it describes Hollywood to me. Doesn't it to you? Earthly, sensual, devilish. Worldly wisdom is toxic, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but um, I know sometimes Julie and I have these moments where we're on a bit of a health kick and we, uh, we check the ingredients of what we, what we have. You know, you get the, uh, the continental soup out and uh, you try to read the... Uh, you try to read the ingredients, you know. <laughs> you say, oh, okay, the, the, the nutrition information. Nutrition information. Do you ever do that? Yes. Do we stop and think before we consume something? Yeah. What's in it? Check the, uh, the product information. Ingredients. Product, product of. 
made in Australia from at least 10% Australian ingredients. <laughs> Where's the other stuff come from? <laughs> you know, think about it. When you buy something from the shop, I'm just being a bit light-hearted here, but what about if we do this with the food that we consume, what about all the other stuff we're feeding ourselves with? We're feeding our minds with, yeah? If we get the, uh, that product... Think of the product that you might be watching on television. The product. Do we say, oh, who, who made this? It's a product of hell. Oh, oh, Hollywood. It's a product of... It's made by the devil. Oh, no. It won't tell you that, but <laughs> if you look close enough, you'll see his fingerprints on some of it, won't you? What are we feeding our minds with? The stuff that comes through the, the idiot box, <laughs> is it wholesome? Nutrition information, is it wholesome? Is it good for your soul? Do we stop and think? We can eat all kinds of things, can't we? Consume all kinds of things. But what goes in the ear gate and the eye gate? You know, product of Hollywood. Oh, there's a warning sign. You check the uh, product information, contains swearing. Blasphemy, immodesty, innuendos, coarse language, loose morals. Doesn't sound very wholesome, does it? Doesn't sound very, very wholesome to me. Is this product good for me and my children? Is it good for me and my family? Do we exercise discernment? Think of it. I'm being lighthearted here, but do we get the magnifying glass of discernment out and check the products? Read the fine print, carcinogenic to your spiritual life. Now, we've he heard on the news lately, I know Julie and I have thought, well, aspartame, they're saying, they're, saying that, they're saying right out now, it's carcinogenic. You know, all the Diet Coke, Pepsi Max. Read the ingredients carefully. You see that product number, what is it, 150 or something? They, they just hide it as a number. Yes. It's aspartame. Uh, some are saying, well, just a little bit of aspartame is okay for you. So just a little bit of that carcinogenic is okay. But think of it, think of it spiritually, though, honestly. Could what we're consuming through what we watch on telly, on the screens, cause a spiritual malnourishment? Can lead to backsliding? could be damaging to your spiritual life. We've got to think about it, don't we? Think about it. So we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about the wisdom that is from above, is from God, the wisdom that is from the earth, worldly, devilish, sensual. Paul talks about this sort of thing too. He talks about godless philosophies and deceptions, and he says this, beware, be on your guard. We see that in Colossians 2, verse 8. He says, beware lest anyone spoil you. In other words, take you captive through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. We see here in the context, it talks about seductive principles of the world that will captivate. There's a lot of godless philosophies that can hold people captive. Lots of ideologies that hold people captive take them captive, that reject God and his authority. Think of it. You don't always read the fine print of what, who's it manufactured by. Human-centred ideas that shut God out of people's thoughts and consciousness. Think of it today. Many people don't even think about God, do they? You get that when you're witnessing. We get people just say some uh, throwaway line like, uh, oh, I don't have time to think about that. You know, I don't care about, I don't care about religion. Uh, I'm not into spiritual things. Many people don't want to think about God. And it talks about that in Psalm 10. It says the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Some people just deliberately shut God out of their lives, out of their thinking. They don't want to process the truth, to face up to the fact that they're lost, they need to be saved, that they're a sinner that will stand one day and face the judge personally the ultimate judge, they don't want to face up to the hard truth that they are a sinner and need a saviour. 
This world is hopelessly hellbound, and they're hurtling towards destruction to Judgment Day. Without God, they are without hope, it says. They are vain in their imaginations, in the pride of their countenance. Friends, the evidence for God is actually staring them in the face, but they shut down to that. We see, for example, Romans 1 tells how the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts was dark and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Since the invisible things of him are seen, creation bears witness to the designer who made it. These things are clearly seen so that they are without excuse. Yes, their foolish heart is darkened, it says. They've become fools. We have to confront the godless culture with reality, with truth. This these godless philosophies, this wisdom that is from beneath, it's earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. The godless culture is damnable and we have to call it for what it is. Think of it, friends, today, of our nation. Australia is not a Christian nation. It is a godless land, a God-forsaking land, a pagan people ripe for judgment. Peter urged the people of his day As he stood up in Jerusalem, thank God 3,000 souls were saved when he said this. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. He's saying to the crowd, this generation is corrupt. It's crooked, it's depraved, it's perverse, it's rotten. Wickedness prevails. We don't have to look too long to see who made it and uh, what's behind it and what the ingredients are the nutrition information of what this world dishes up for your mind, for your children. Wickedness prevails. We must repent and believe the gospel, trust the saviour. What this world needs is for Christ. It's Christ we need in this vain and pointless world. Without him, it's empty. What the world counts as cool and smart is sometimes vain and empty. It's talking about human wisdom, worldly wisdom. It falls short. It fails to pass the test of real life. And think about the media of our world. It's sick and rotten, isn't it, to the core? The Bible says, set your affection on heaven, not Hollywood. Set your affection on things above. Amen? This world and its messaging treats modesty and purity as something they want to spoil and soil. They would urge people to live carelessly and selfishly. Young people, save yourself for marriage. Live pure. Don't trash yourself and dishonor your body. Don't believe the devil's lies. The world would say just live for the moment, live recklessly and loosely. The Bible calls for wisdom and truth. It warns us against things. We would do well to listen. The world just parties on. The world says dull the mind. The Bible says be sober. We read that drunkenness is a sin. How do we avoid it? The best policy, really, is don't touch the stuff. You never become a drunk if you don't drink. This world is in a drunken stupor, blind drunk. People are in darkness. That's where the devil wants them. He wants them to stay there. We have need of wisdom. We have need of wisdom. The so-called wisdom of this world falls far short. What the world calls wisdom, God calls foolishness. We see that 1 Corinthians 1. It says, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? But it says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If we can tune into God, to God's wavelength, we can trust him. Think of this world and where it's going. And it seems like it's picking up pace, doesn't it? This world, it denies absolute truth. It rejects God, secular society just chases after materialism, worldly possessions, but they're just left with disappointment, discontentment. It's vain, vanity. Godless philosophies will only bring spiritual emptiness. And everyday people sit trance-like, like zombies, in front of the electronic mind-altering devices that they call television sets. 
there's a godless agenda out there. We need to wake up to it. Honestly, we've got to exercise some discernment is the point, really, of this message. So in contrast to the empty humanistic philosophies, our Lord calls us to faith, to faith. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Some would exalt human reason above God's wisdom. But it is God who is the ultimate source of morality and authority. Here is true wisdom. Trust in the Lord. That is the true wisdom. As someone has put it, wisdom is a choice that begins with a decision to trust Christ as Saviour. That's true wisdom. Trust in the Lord. That's the wisest choice any of us can make. A choice we'll never regret. Because we need him to lead, to guide, to show us the way. We have to get the God dimension right. God is the source of wisdom. It's almost like there's a part of some people's brains that it just doesn't light up. The God dimension, as it were. That part of their brain that is asleep. They're literally in the dark. Part of their brain is dead. Their spirit is dead. It says their heart is darkened, as we read before, and also in minds. It talks about that in 2 Corinthians 4. It says... Of those who are lost, the gospel is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It's almost like there's a blackness, there's a darkness in their mind, in their soul, in their spirit. But thank God we can know him. He wants us to. He wants to show himself to you. Rather than the emptiness of humanism, we can know God's truth. That sets people free. Peter says, save yourselves from this untoward, this, this perverse generation. You can be saved. Saved. Gloriously saved. Body, soul and spirit. We need the wisdom that is from above. And he's written it down and he's given it to us in a book. Amen. This is it. You don't need to go looking for some lost books of the Bible, the 66, that's enough. <laughs> It's all here in, the, in, the, in between the covers of your Bible. The 66 books of the Bible, that's what we need. And he's written it all down in, in there for us to receive it. In contrast to worldly wisdom, there is godly wisdom which is from above, from God. And that's what we need. Talked a bit about this wisdom that is from beneath. It's not from above. It's earthly, sensual, devilish. What about the wisdom that is from above? It's the glorious gospel. It's God's truth by which we can be saved. It's the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. He's written it down, this wisdom from above, and he's given it to us in a book that you can hold in your hand. You can even have it on your tablet, on your phone. So in contrast to worldly wisdom, there's godly wisdom, which is from above, from God. And we read of that in James 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's talking about God's wisdom, which is from above. Again, two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom that is not from above, earthly, sensual, devilish, wisdom that is from above, and we see the characteristics of that, the seven. Pure. God's wisdom is pure, it's clean, it's genuine, it's untainted, it's not soiled. There's no, there's no warning messages contain some uh, disgusting content. No, there's none of that. This contains pure truth. It's not soiled by the world and its pollution. I saw recently some people mocking a preacher and uh, they were saying about Christians that Christians are just people that are brainwashed. And he said, no, we're not brainwashed, we're blood washed. Amen. Thank God the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. This wisdom that is from above is pure. We can have a purity, a purity within. Because God's truth, his blood, cleanses us from sin. This wisdom that is from above is pure. It's peaceable. Think of God's wisdom, it's, it's peace. It, it engenders peace, doesn't it? It promotes peace. It's the peace 
The highest kind of peace is the peace that passes all understanding, that keeps our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's the peace with God and it's the peace of God. God's wisdom is full of peace. We see God's wisdom is gentle. We see wise people treat people with kindness and compassion, with grace, like God extends towards us. It's gentle. God's wisdom is easy to be entreated. A wise person is willing to listen to others, not just full of themselves. God's wisdom is full of mercy, it says. It's full of mercy. Wise people show compassion and forgiveness. Christ's love has touched our lives, so we want to touch others likewise. We can be gracious towards other people in our lives. It says God's wisdom is full of good fruits. Wisdom bears a crop. It tells of good fruits here. When we have wise understanding, when we have wise decisions, it leads to righteous actions. God's wisdom brings forth blessed fruit, not rotten fruit like the world's ways, like the rotten, gone-off kind of fruit, the bad kind of fruit, corrupt fruit. It says good fruits are going to come when we know God's wisdom. God's wisdom, likewise, is without partiality. So a wise person treats everyone fairly. We can be fair-minded and genuine with people, with everyone in our lives, where we don't have a two-facedness. We're, we're honest and fair. And when you look at this list, we see without hypocrisy. It's Christ, isn't it? He's full of grace and truth. There's no falseness in him. He's without hypocrisy. And we think of all these things, really wisdom is the grace of Jesus, isn't it? It's all of this stuff, all of these characteristics it's Jesus, isn't it? It's the Lord Jesus. He is the perfect expression of wisdom, isn't he? Really, his wisdom personified, as in Proverbs, his wisdom incarnate, his wisdom in the flesh. And James says we can receive such wisdom. We can know God's wisdom in our own lives. How so? We can ask for it. It says in James 1.5, If any man lack wisdom... Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. The wisdom from above is ours for the asking. Simply ask him. It comes from God. Pray that God will help you to know that wisdom. As you open his word, God's truth will speak that wisdom to your heart. That truth that we can apply, we can live it out. It's truth. Truth that works in real life. When you think about it, really, this is the maker's instructions. We wonder why things are going wrong. I know a friend of mine, we were building a shed one day and we started building the shed and putting all the parts together and the framework and such. And, and then the other fellow said, oh, maybe we should read the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like that, aren't we, when we build something? We, we go, go, go ahead full bore and then we think, oh, maybe I should read the instructions. It's like that with life, isn't it? Sometimes we live our life and then we think, oh, maybe I'd better read the maker's instructions, how I should live. When we seek God's wisdom, we can know truth. An exercise to sermon. In John chapter 8, our Lord tells, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Truly, this word of God, this truth, this life-giving truth, this life-changing truth, it's freedom, isn't it? It's freedom. It's not bondage to be a Christian. It's not some yoke. This is, uh, this is the yoke taken off. This is freedom, true freedom. When we know the truth, the one who is the truth, he gives true wisdom and we can be truly free. It's like there's a key that he unlocks, as it were, unlocks our minds that would otherwise be chained and held in bondage. We're enslaved, but he wants to set us free. As, as prisoners in our minds, yet he wants to make us free. The one who is the truth can truly set us free. So the word tells us how we can renew our minds too. As we study the scriptures, we read, of course, that familiar one, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. They may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Wisdom flows from the mind of God. We can be transformed. Literally the metamorpho, like a, a butterfly comes out of 
the chrysalis that was a caterpillar as a transforming. And so, too, we can know the transforming of God's power. And his sure wisdom is what we need to navigate life. We can be grounded and firm in what he tells us, what we believe. It seems, sadly, some people work really hard to fit in, to fit in with our world, and they compromise. Yet, really, rather than trying so hard to fit in, to be one of the boys, one of the girls, as it were, to fit in, to conform, rather, our Lord calls us to be set apart. Set apart, not holier than thou, set apart, but there's a difference there. There's a difference in you. That is Christ, isn't it? Think of the world that follows cultural relativism. That's one of the philosophies of the world. The idea that moral and ethical standards are subjective, they're culturally determined. There's no certainty in that. Cultural relativism. Well, what's the culture today? What's the culture tomorrow? Relativism. There's no certainty there. But for Bible-believing Christians, it's not about conforming to the culture. It's not about fitting in and just talking the talk of the gutter language of the crowd. We've got life-changing truth. God's truth is unchanging. And that is the definition of truth. It's unchanging. There's no updated, revised version. The shifting culture of the world doesn't determine truth. God does. God does. And his truth doesn't change. That's why we need his wisdom. So, friends, think of that. And, and really, the Bible stresses that wisdom is the principal thing. It's the number one thing. It says, if you're going to get anything, get this. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's the main thing. Modern media is constantly promoting a host of ungodly philosophies and ideals. Just think of it. You don't really have to even tune into. Uh, and what I like to do when I hear about some new movie, not that I go and watch them, but just to be informed, it's really helpful. And if you're inclined, you feel to go to some worldly movie, to watch some movie, first do this. Read the Christian movie reviews to see what they contain. It uh, actually contains a whole lot of trash that you don't want your children to watch. You know, that's what you need to do, people. Amen? Before you go and watch the worldly movie, the latest Hollywood offerings, think about it. Use some discernment. There's crying need for discernment today. People of God, most, most certainly there's crying need for discernment today. Movies are geared often these days, and let's face it, I'm being honest with you this morning, movies geared for children these days, they often feature witches, spells, magic, spirits. You don't have to be Einstein to know that's not of God. It's not of God. There's no question. You can't, you can't kind of, oh, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that might be okay. Oh, I can accommodate this. I can, I can overlook this or that. No. There's no getting around it. There's no argy-bargy about it. If it's got witches, spells, magic and spirits, then it is wisdom that is earthly, sensual, devilish. It's like you check the food products. You check the label. Product of. Made in. Where's this made by? Worldly media. Who's making it? Largely, they're God-haters. They're God-haters, leftists. It's earthly, sensual, devilish. The psalmist says, and here's your TV guide. Here's your TV guide. Psalm 101, 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I've heard it said some people like to put this verse on top of their TV sets. Now, a big thing lately is the Barbie movie. Who's heard of that? This is just one example. One of the philosophies that the Barbie movie promotes, and uh, some relatives of mine have been talking about it, it's, it's bad news. It's extreme feminism. This is just one example, one example of Hollywood propaganda. And there's constant messaging. In this movie, for example, it outrightly attacks men. Men are the problem. Of course, sometimes they are. I'll admit that. <laughs> but, but it attacks men. It mocks men. As it mocks masculinity. It mocks patriarchy. And what does it promote? 
Trans people. Alphabet people. What is it, trash? It's against motherhood. It's teaching young children, oh, motherhood is something you don't want. And uh, there's all these messagings in this movie. Do you want your children to see that? Feminism at its heart opposes the specific roles and distinctions that God has established for men and women. And men are routinely portrayed as effeminate. Manliness is scarce. Masculinity is called toxic. And in movies like Barbie, men prance around with feminine looks instead of being manly. While the women wear the pants. Everything is topsy-turvy, isn't it? Think of the world, what it's pushing, ungodly ideas like abortion. It's a violation of human life as created by God, the sanctity of life. So friends, think of it as you exercise discernment. You think of the wisdom that is not from above. You think of the wisdom that is from above. We're truly in a battle of world views. In the school, these things are increasingly happening too. Jeremiah says, learn not the way of the heathen. What are parents to do in a world like this? More than ever before, we need to be setting the good, godly role model for our children need. The best school is probably the home, isn't it? I, I, I know for myself, we never homeschooled. But looking back, I think that would have been a better choice. Learn not the way of the heathen. You know, the Bible urges us, love not the world. Let's not take that track. The ways of the godless world, it leads to destruction. But true wisdom and fulfillment is found in our Lord. The truth is that God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Godless philosophies deny God's existence in creation. The messaging, the conditioning is a constant stream of foolishness. The fool has said in his heart there is no God says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. You know, you might have some great qualifications the world can give, but really it's foolishness with God, isn't it? And that's not to deny there's some value in, in secular education, and I've got a master's degree. I'm not denying there's some value in, in earthly knowledge and training and skills. But when the world puts the focus on that, there's a vanity there. It misses the whole point of life. Thankfully, in all of the confusion that abounds, we can know a sure source of truth, unchanging truth, life-changing truth. The wisdom of this world compared to God's word, it's chalk and cheese, isn't it, really? And so where can we get this wisdom? It says it comes from above. It comes from God. We read that in Proverbs 2, verse 6 through 7. It says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. Here's a buckler like a shield to them that walk uprightly. It says the Lord gives wisdom. People, here's the source of that. Wisdom, that is the principal thing. This is where wisdom comes from. The Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And J.C. Ross said, A man who is born again does not use the world's opinion as his standard of right and wrong. The world's opinion of right and wrong changes from time to time. This doesn't change. It doesn't matter what is popular or trendy. We must have the strong foundation, not a faulty one, to build upon. We think of our world people today, talking about wisdom, the so-called information age, how we need wisdom, how we have such a dire need of wisdom when there's constant social engineering and conditioning going on. We need timeless wisdom, timeless wisdom from the pages of the Holy Bible. And it starts here, people, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Really, here's the definition of wisdom. It starts with knowing God truly. He is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord, to know him, to know God truly, to know the holy one, to have knowledge of the holy one. And we can know him. You can know him. By faith, you can know him. The Lord Jesus, you can know him, personally know him. And wisdom is a precious gift from God. He gives it. We can find true joy in knowing him. It tells us here, this is true joy. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. So it's saying here, if you get wisdom, if you get understanding, 
That's far better than acquiring any earthly wealth or accumulating of such. Rather find wisdom. Get that. That's true wealth. As likewise it says, Proverbs 16, 16. How much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. So we could spend a, a lifetime acquiring gold and putting those gold ingots under the bed and, uh, you know, or putting the, stuffing the, the money in the mattress. But how much better, how much better it is to get wisdom? Yeah. How much better it is? Let's make that our life mission, to seek wisdom rather than occupying our time on that which is wasteful and vain and, and it's got doubtful content. <laughs> rather... Get wisdom. Amen. Get wisdom. Spend time in the word. Let's make that our life mission to seek after God's wisdom, to get understanding. It's here in our hands. We can hold it. We can, we can acquire it. We can store it in our hearts by faith. Make it your desire. And Proverbs 2, it tells us likewise, incline thine ear unto wisdom. Apply thine heart to Understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So I encourage you this morning, I urge you this morning, here is wisdom, it's found here. Will we receive it or reject it? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So wisdom, we can acquire some Secular wisdom that might be of some usefulness, but wisdom per se is not some intellectual search. Really, it's a spiritual journey. And wisdom is when we know the Saviour, when we know the Creator, the Maker of our life, and wisdom is truly that priceless gift of knowing Him. So may the fear of the Lord lead us to live lives that honour Him and bless those around us. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are wisdom, righteousness and power. You are the one who gives us wisdom in this world that has a lack of it. We see the world's wisdom is earthly, sensual, devilish. We see that it's really no wisdom at all. Yet, Lord, your word is filled with wisdom. As we read the Proverbs, as we see the very person that you are, our Lord Jesus, as the one who is wisdom, in your gracious life, in, in who you are to us. You are wisdom, Lord, and we pray that we might come to know you. We pray each one here might know what it is to know the fear of the Lord, to know you as our own saviour, our master. We pray, Lord, you help us to exercise discernment when we see there's so much we can consume. We can consume uh, not just food, but we can consume products for our mind, uh, products that will affect our thinking. Uh, we can tune into the wavelength of the world, into that which is ungodly. Help us, Lord, to rather choose that which is righteous, to choose that which would honour and please you. We pray that each one might know, again personally, what it is to trust you as their own personal saviour, that They'll seek out prayer if they've yet to do that, to confirm that this morning. And for each of us that trust you, Lord, help us to have that righteous affection that sets itself on things above, not on things on the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.